guys what's going on. Today I'm going to systematically dismantle the genre of ASMR, telling you just a few of the most controversial stories that have plagued the community since its rise to fame in the early 2000s. Okay, okay, I can't do it anymore. Let's talk about the darkest depths of ASMR. This entire video isn't going to be in ASMR, I just wouldn't do that to you guys. So first things first, I want to give you a little rundown on what ASMR is, just for the few people that are watching this video that might not know. So ASMR stands for Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response, and is defined as the tingling sensation that usually begins in the scalp and moves down to the back of the neck and the upper spine. If you want a dumbed down definition, it's light sounds made that's meant to trigger a tingling feeling in you, it's meant to be relaxing, but to some people, they get a bit of a different feeling out of it. But we'll get to that in just a moment. This sensation is not felt by everyone, but it is felt by me, unfortunately. I don't really watch any ASMR videos, but I understand what the feeling is like. Even still, it's one of the largest and most established niches on the internet today. So hopefully you know enough about the basics now that you can understand the controversies that the niche has found itself embroiled in over the past few years. With the basics out of the way, Let's talk about them. Now, the first story I want to talk about might be a bit predictable, but I definitely think it's the best place to start. As this video goes on, we'll march into darker territory. But at least for now, I want to talk about the type of people that consume ASMR content. There'll likely be a lot of ASMR fans watching this very video, but if you are one of those people, you might be shocked to find out that there's been research conducted that has found links between ASMR and neuroticism. Just in case you don't know what neuroticism is, it's a personality trait that heightens the chance to frequently experience negative emotions such as anger, fear, jealousy, and anxiety. In February 2022, there was a study conducted by Charlotte M. Eide, Colin Hamilton, and Joanna H. Greer, which aimed to understand the link between ASMR and neuroticism as well as anxiety. They took 36 people that experienced ASMR and 28 people that didn't, and made them watch a 5-minute ASMR video with common triggers. Prior to this video though, they made each of these people fill out a small questionnaire on their levels of neuroticism and anxiety, both predisposed anxiety and their current anxiety levels. What they found were that people that experienced ASMR had significantly higher scores in neuroticism and anxiety than non-ASMR experiences. But also interestingly, these people, the ones that claimed to experience ASMR, had significantly decreased anxiety levels after watching the 5 minute video. The non-ASMR experiences had no real change of anxiety prior to or after the video, they stayed the same. Therefore, it's logical to conclude that ASMR has a positive impact on people that experience neuroticism and anxiety, it soothes them out. And your love for ASMR might not be as optional as you think, you're drawn towards it because it has a positive impact on you, it's therapeutic to you. So do keep this in mind over the next 20 minutes as I take a steamy dump on ASMR. It has a lot of skeletons in its closet. When harnessed in the right context, it can be a force for good. These stories I'm about to tell you though, is when it's harnessed for the wrong reasons. So with that said, I want to turn our attention now to perhaps the most overarching controversy within the ASMR community. A lot of the stories I'm about to get into can be traced back to this single problem, and that is the gender divide within the ASMR community, especially when it comes to sexism. So first things first, ASMR is traditionally thought to be a female dominated niche online. A Medium article published in October 2019 claimed that when searching for the term ASMR on YouTube, out of the first 15 results, 12 of them were by women and only 3 were by men. I decided to do the same thing as well, heading onto my incognito tab, for reasons, and my results were similar. Of the first 15 results I was shown, 13 of them were female ASMR creators to only 2 male. Now there are a number of reasons for this, but the main ones that I found is that a female's voice is generally lighter than a man's, so it's more fit for ASMR, that whispering and speaking softly isn't traditionally a male trait, so there's generally less male ASMR artists, and that while female viewers don't tend to have a preference in who they watch when it comes to gender, male viewers don't generally want to listen to other male ASMR artists. Now this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Throughout the internet there are some online communities that are dominated by men, and there are other online communities that are dominated by women. The problem lies in the fact that in the past there have been a lot of male ASMR viewers that have sexualized ASMR creators, female creators specifically. And if you don't believe me, which you definitely do, I mean come on, it's blokes on the internet. 
Either way, I'm taking you back to 2012. We're taking things back a decade to talk about the early days of ASMR on the internet, specifically one of the pioneers of the niche named ASMR Auret. Before the niche blew up, just like anything, it had to have its early days. And in the case of ASMR Auret, she was one of the first creators to gain some serious traction making these videos, gaining tens of thousands of subscribers. Re-uploads of her content today tend to garner hundreds of thousands of views, but her videos had to be re-uploaded because at some point in either late 2014 or early 2015, she permanently deleted her own channel without notifying her fans. And this led many of them to take to Reddit to ask, why? The community came up with two leading theories. The first one was that she was just generally a very busy person and now did not have the time for YouTube. I'm not sure about her age, but she does seem to be an older teen to young adult. Obviously that age comes with a very busy life. She might have just not wanted to carry on with YouTube anymore. That's a logical answer. But second was that she had been harassed and perhaps even stalked. But more generally, many people on these Reddit posts claim to have seen some severe harassment in her comments. And even Auret would bring this up in a video that she made shortly before her disappearance called What ASMRists Think. I wanna your Oh God. Whatever the reason, the likelihood is that we'll never know. This happened almost a decade ago now. But the fact that this is the first place that people went after one of the largest ASMR creators of her time disappeared is not a good look for the niche. Or at the very least, it wasn't all those years ago. So based on that previous story, I think it's fair to say that some people sexualize ASMR. I don't think it's too controversial to say that some people get their kicks from it. The art form is inherently intimate. It's like someone whispering into your ear, which is always a good sign if you're into that person. But apparently PayPal thought it was too hot to handle because in September 2018, they actually froze the accounts of many of the most popular ASMR artists. And this was apparently because they were violating PayPal's acceptable use policy on adult oriented services. This is 100% legitimate, believe it or not. Some of the largest creators in the ASMR community, such as ASMR Glow, Scottish Murmurs ASMR, Creative Calm ASMR, and Rose ASMR, took to social media to reveal that they had had their PayPal accounts frozen. And this was because back in 2018, there was a conversation being had about whether this niche could be considered adult work, even if it wasn't intending to be. It's to my knowledge that over the past few years, PayPal has increasingly put restrictions on this particular type of job, with them ceasing to take payments from The Hub back in 2019 and having it written on the top of one of their policy pages that it doesn't allow account holders to buy or sell sexually oriented goods or services. Now, whether this was a good thing or a bad thing, that's up to your judgment. But by putting a freeze on these accounts, PayPal essentially came out and said that they thought that ASMR is inherently sexually oriented. So the question has to be asked, is it? And for that, I want to direct you to a study published by the University of Swansea in 2015 by Emma L. Barrett and Nick J. Davis, where they took a sample of 245 men, 222 women, and eight non-binary people ranging between 18 and 54 years old from Western Europe and North America, each of which claimed to experience ASMR. They asked each of them to fill out a survey based on their relationship with the niche. And what they found out, among other things, was that 5% of the people asked reportedly were sexually interested in ASMR, with 84% of people disagreeing with that statement, and I guess 11% of people not having a strong opinion on it. But what that means is that at least one in 20 of you guys that watch my intro and experience ASMR got some sort of weird, sick pleasure from it, you freaks. But on a more serious note, because that 5% of ASMR listeners are into it, PayPal thought, you know what, that's enough so that those creators are violating our policies. In fact, that 5% of people seems to be significant enough so that there's a word that describes the content that's been made with them in mind. Every time someone uploads a suggestive ASMR video, it could be described as ASMR erotica, which I have to give it to them, that is a good name. But it seems as though PayPal wasn't such a big fan of this. But they weren't the only ones to have this belief, because did you know that just a few months prior, in July 2018, ASMR was fully banned in China? If you know anything about modern China, you'll know that especially when it comes to online content, they tend to be very strict in what they allow their citizens to see and share. And apparently ASMR is just one of those things that the Chinese government have deemed to be untenable within their society. I'm sure you're interested to find out why, but I think you as well as I already know the answer. It's down to its potentially vulgar and pornographic content. 
That 5% in the Swansea study really stitched everyone up, because apparently China agreed that that 5% is just too high, even if I do doubt they based their decision on the Swansea study. And so even though the vast majority of people that listen to ASMR don't get any gratification of that nature out of it, China still decided to remove ASMR from their largest video streaming sites, such as Yuku, Bilibili and Douyu. But do remember that Western platforms in which ASMR is rife, such as YouTube and Twitch, are all banned in China anyway to begin with. Honestly, I could make an entire Book of the Band video about what's banned in China, and I guarantee it would be at least six hours long. But back on topic, the country's anti-pornography office came out to say that there was what they deemed inappropriate content that was being hidden within these videos, hiding under the guise of being a relaxing ASMR video, but in reality, being much more adult which, and this is gonna sound a bit strange, they kind of have a point. There's a lot of creators out there that know about the 5% and therefore create content to cater towards them. But the controversy comes in when you consider that the vast majority of ASMR content uploaded is not explicitly for this reason. Some of it might be a bit questionable whether it is or isn't, but you have to say that just tapping on your keyboard or scanning stuff at the supermarket, like surely there's nothing too weird about that, right? Either way, China decided to put a blanket ban on all things ASMR. So unless they've repealed it since, there's no soft chewing in Chongqing, no whispers in Wuhan, no buzzing in Beijing, and no tapping in Tianjin. And since we're on the topic of ASMR being outlawed, let's talk about Twitch. Because over the past few years especially, there have been many large female streamers that have either been banned or suspended from the site because of their ASMR content. I really don't want to spend too long on this one because it's kind of more of the same. The only difference is that the creators that were getting banned, are getting banned, and will be getting banned are all doing it because they're clearly violating Twitch's policy on sex and nudity. Like, there's no other way about it. Even though I've already made the point that most ASMR content is not for this reason, the people getting banned off Twitch were definitely doing it for adult gratification. So for me, it's quite difficult to say that their bannings weren't justified. It's right there in the policy rulebook, you can't do this kind of stuff. And even though there's no nudity, nothing's inherently being shown most of the time, I mean, these women know what they're doing. They know the 5% is flocking over to their channels for a specific reason. Whether or not it's fair that Twitch has this policy in place to begin with, that's up to your own personal discretion, but since it does, you have to abide by the rules set in place by the platform on which you're on. In this case, we had Saber Princess, who was banned in February 2022 after sucking on her microphone, which is clearly meant to be simulating something else. The video is so on the nose on what it's meant to be simulating that I don't even think I can show it here. I believe that this was the highest profile case just in terms of how viral the clip went, but there's also some other high profile cases in terms of streamer size that have happened too. As in June 2021, both Amaranth and Indie Fox were banned from Twitch for their suggestive content. Amaranth got her account back later on, as I'm sure a lot of you know, but I believe that Indie Fox did not, and I actually spoke about her case more in depth in my Twitch video in my book of the band series, so if you're interested in her story in more depth, go watch that video after this one. But if you look up Indie Fox's Twitch account, to this very day, it says that she's been suspended because of violating the platform's terms of service. But even having said that, we all know that there's just so many subgenres within the ASMR community. I mean, yes, you've got your risque videos, but you've also got your makeup tutorials, you've got your roleplay, you've just got your normal tapping videos, and of course, you've got your mukbangs. These are videos where people eat gargantuan portions of food. It's one of the largest corners of the ASMR universe, and coincidentally, it's the topic of many of our next controversies because the niche has recently come under fire with many people questioning whether it's actually good, as many people have recently began to worry that it actually causes eating disorders. Okay, there is a lot to unpack here, and it's a very touchy and heavy subject, so let me be just very upfront about this. I have never experienced anything close to what someone might consider an eating disorder. I've never been too overweight, I've never been too underweight, I've never consistently overindulged, I've never really stopped myself from eating, I've always kind of just been fine with who I am and my body. I basically have zero experience on anything to do with eating disorders, so essentially everything I'm about to say comes from articles and studies done by people who are way more knowledgeable in the area than I am. 
such as the one published in the Metro back in April 2020 by Matthias Strand and Sana Alia Gustafsson, whose study aimed to explore how viewers of mukbang videos relate their audience experiences to symptoms of disordered eating. They analysed a total of 986 YouTube comments from the most popular ASMR videos and also analysed 330 online posts from Reddit where the topic of mukbangs and eating disorders were discussed. They found that when typing, people would either use an insider or an outsider perspective. An outsider perspective, for example, is much more observational. The commenter is keeping a distance between themselves and what's happening in the video, so they'll be commenting on what's actually happening there. An insider perspective, on the other hand, is someone that's relating the video back to themselves. They categorised the outsider comments into one of four groups. Envy and amazement, body shaming, supportive and explanation. But the more problematic of these perspectives, on the other hand, was the insider perspective. These had six categories. These were comments that limited eating, comments that increased eating, comments that were ambivalent and straight down the middle, comments that reduced loneliness, comments that reduced guilt, and comments that were obsessive and self-destructive. So these were their findings from analysing these comments. Firstly, the researchers often had a difficult time determining whether a comment should be classified as healthy or unhealthy because they don't know the person that left it. An insider perspective on one of these videos, for example, that said the user wanted to eat less could go either way, because if the user was already underweight, this would be deemed as unhealthy, but if they were morbidly obese, this would be considered more healthy. And it works the other way around, because if a comment was left saying the person wanted to eat more because of this video, well, if they were underweight, that would potentially be a good healthy thing, but if they were morbidly obese to begin with, that would be considered more unhealthy. But the researchers brought this up, and I think it's important to remember, it doesn't just have to be one thing, right? Healthy or unhealthy, black or white. There are shades of grey in between. But having said that, they also noted that there's been an escalation in the niche over the years, with earlier videos being much more modest portions but being sensationalised into comically large amounts later on, because these videos just happen to get the most views. People click on these videos to gawk at the people that are scoffing down these family-sized portions. Some of them scoff at the food, others grow hungry because of it. And it's also fair to assume that these comments were left by older teenagers and young adults, as 18 to 24 year olds make up roughly half of the ASMR age demographic. And to make matters worse, this is almost the perfect storm for eating disorders because it's right in the most common age that they occur, being most prevalent in females aged between about 12 and 25. The researchers concluded by saying that there is a striking ambivalence in the ASMR community, and that ASMR mukbangs don't just have to be helpful or destructive, they can be both at the same time both useful and hurtful. These things can exist at the same time, because while for some it could help with their eating disorders, for others it could make it worse. I understand that this is more to do with mukbangs as a whole than ASMR, but since mukbangs are just such a huge part of the ASMR community, I thought it was important to mention them in this video, and mention them we will continue to do. So while we're at it, let's talk about an ASMR mukbang YouTuber who absolutely boils my blood. My hatred for her is only second to my ex-girlfriend and future wife Samantha. I know you're watching this by the way. It's only you that exceeds how much I hate so young. Now the last time I mentioned her on this channel was probably about a year ago when she was still eating live squids and octopuses. But these days it seems as though she cooks her proteins in advance, which works to be less cruel and also more visually appealing. So these criticisms that I have of her are at the very least what she did a few years ago. But what she was doing back then, I genuinely believe was cruel. If you don't watch her videos or you've never heard of her, as I mentioned, she did ASMR mukbangs, but with a twist of torture. In a fair portion of the videos that she made, her food was still alive and squirming. So she would kind of play around with it a lot, almost making it a bit of a sick game. After a long indoor build up, where these fish or squid or octopuses would try and crawl away, she would eventually kill it. But half the time it was just so torturous she would stab it without ending its life. It was absolutely horrible to watch. I've got to think that next to Nikocado Avocado, So Young is the most controversial mukbang YouTuber, but when it comes to ASMR, she is head and shoulders above the rest of the competition. But since the last time I checked, she doesn't really seem to do it so much anymore, perhaps the backlash was just too much for her, so I can now say that she is no longer my arch nemesis. So let's flip things around for our next story. We're going to talk about a popular subgenre within a popular subgenre within ASMR. Let's talk about animal ASMR mukbangs. These are actually videos where animals are being way overfed during their ASMR mukbangs. 
Now, here's the thing, especially when you have a pet, you will know that it is vital to keep them a healthy weight. It's just not fair to them to give them food to a point where they're obese and can't move about. You need to give them a fair, balanced diet and let them have plenty of exercise, especially if they're a dog, because if they're a cat, they'll just kind of sit there on their ass. But if they're a dog, you need to get them out and running. And as long as we're using dogs as an example, you need to know that it's so important to give them food that's actually fit for dogs. But it was two years ago when there was a dog ASMR mukbang that went viral in China, and it challenged two dogs to eat 38 different snacks and eight drinks. When it ended, one of them had its belly fully distended. And probably worse yet is the absolute cruel scenes of people feeding their dogs bowls of chili peppers. I mean, this is straight up animal abuse. I don't even know if I can show it. All for the sake of a few measly clicks, people were doing just disgusting, unethical, vile, evil, disturbed things to their dogs. On this article that I read about the situation, it was published in Chinese, so I had to translate it over, but it claims that on Douyin, the Chinese version of TikTok, mistreating your pets for some clicks and follows is somewhat normal. Videos such as what is this cat's angry reaction and cat learns to swim for the first time became very popular. The latter of which gained over 5 million views. And if you've been following my channel for a while now, you might know that this sounds eerily similar to something I brought up in my terminated YouTube channels video, because that was the video where I discussed fake animal rescue content. These were videos where people would intentionally put animals into distressing or outright dangerous situations just for the sake of rescuing them on camera, seeming like a hero and gaining a bunch of clicks. So we've just gone full circle because apparently China has been doing that too. So yeah, if you're thinking of setting up an ASMR channel in the future, because I'm sure there'll be a few ASMR fans watching this very video, make sure not to include your pets in it. Or at the very least, don't abuse them on camera for the entire world to see. Do it behind closed doors. Okay, 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 that was a joke. That was, I was joking there. And with that cancelable joke, I think it's time to close the doors on this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please make sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already. I have a bunch of social medias that will be linked in the description, my Twitter, my Instagram specifically. Go follow me on there if you want. I'll see you all in the next video. Thank you for watching.